Welcome to the Business of Being You podcast. My name is Marco Benitez, also known as Coach Marco B. I'm an authenticity and burnout coach. And today in this podcast episode, we're going to have a conversation with Clover Lamb. As you know, in this podcast, I share reflections and I share deep insights. And on an episode like today, we have conversations with someone who has chosen to not only live their life authentically, but also to help others to be the most authentic version of themselves as well. Today, my guest is Clover Lamb. Clover is a holistic money coach who underwent a transformative journey of empowerment through divorce, finding her authentic self and taking control of her finances. Now she shares her insight to empower others to live authentically, reclaim financial independence, and align their lifestyles with their deepest values. Clover, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Marco. I'm super excited to have this conversation with you. Likewise. So when we spoke before, I found your story to be very interesting and, and I want to dive right in, but I want to give people some context first. We're talking about authentic abundance and that coincidentally happens to be the name of your brand. Tell me, first of all, what, what does authentic abundance mean? Um, it means to align your financial resources to a life that is true to you, that is authentic to you. Because in the society, we're bombarded with social media messages by your family, by your peers of what a perfect life should look like. Uh, but in reality, we all know that after going through you know, enough life experiences, that is not the case. So how do we even find our true selves uh, with finding our values, for example, and removing all those noise from other people um, and making that our North Star uh, so that we can um, put the financial resources together that is actually tailored to that. Uh, so that is why I created my brand uh, through my own experiences and um, through helping other people. I love that. And Many, and you mentioned something really important, which is aligning your values with your financial goals. Because from what I see, many people feel like in order to, um, if you don't win the lotto, if you don't acquire a large sum of money, it's going to require a certain amount of discipline with, with your finances. But at the same time, your strategy shows your clients that it's not just about tightening the belt. While you do have to sacrifice maybe some things, it does not mean depriving yourself of a life that you want to live. And I, and I, I love that about um, how you, you, you speak with your clients. And I want you to share all of those tips with us or as many as you can think of uh, in the time that we're going to be together. But I wanted to start off, how did you even get into this space? Mm -hmm. This is actually a very unconventional way to get into the space. Um, so during the pandemic, I was laid off. Um, I work with the airline and, you know, there was a lot of time to reflect when you have a lot of downtime. Now, at the time, I already have a bit of a net worth through understanding how money works and really managing my money and investing that. And so I had a lot of time and space. I didn't feel pressured to work, but I wanted to find my purpose what is actually true to me, my calling, my gifts, and, and such. And so then I um, created a platform called Unconventional Asians. And through there, I interview a lot of unconventional Asians, and one of which is a spiritual business coach. And she is a psychic, and she was able to hear from the universe that uh, I'm supposed to combine money with consciousness. Mm. And at the time when I heard it, I actually didn't really understand what that means. It took me about two years to really uh, trial and error and see what how it fits with the life experiences that I have and um, the knowledge that I have. And so uh, really, I feel like that is my calling. The more I work towards that and with making a difference in other people and the, and the joy that I I get out of it. And so I'm feeling super blessed now that I found that specific uh, calling and I feel super fulfilled by it. Uh, so it's, it's kind of an unconventional story, but I, I feel like, you know, it's something that works for me. Right. And you mentioned money and consciousness. And for those who are not too familiar with that term of consciousness, what would be a, a, a way that they could understand how combining those two would look like? Yeah. So really the brand name of authentic abundance already encapsulate that and so consciousness for me just means awareness of yourself right so if you find your authentic self that's really being more conscious 
um, also with money of your lifestyle and with who you are and just aligning the financial planning with it. And you mentioned that you started with a certain amount of net worth to begin with, but is your background training in finances, in, in uh, um, money management, or is this something that you had to bootstrap and learn on your own? Definitely the latter. <laughs> so what happened was uh, I got divorced when I was 30, uh, so about 10 years ago, and I was married to a finance bro. And when we separated, I had this fear, almost this survival instinct that I really need to learn to take care of myself financially. Because I was so reliant on him, I knew nothing about money, like zero, even the most basic like 401k in the US terms in Canada, it's like RSPs, CFSAs. Um, I didn't even know any of that. And so I realized, okay, this is a life skill that I really need to pick up. But I was so intimidated by the finance jargons that my ex used to throw at me. But I think the fear override <laughs> the, the frustration of learning. And so I really just went all out on the internet, uh, podcasts, books, everything about money. Um, and I tapped into the space called uh, Financially Independent Retire Early, FIRE. And that's where that community really spoke to me. Um, and in particular, I found a blog who is Canadian who retired at the age of 30 and 31 um, really resonated. And from there, I just went down the rabbit hole and started doing the same strategy um, from there and be able to manage my money and build um, my six figure net worth. Nice. So one of my goals with the, with my, one of my major goals, I should say with this podcast is to speak to that one person that's watching this, that, hear something and it kind of makes their ears perk up and they say, wait a minute, that, that, that sounds like me I, or I feel this on the inside, you know? And one of my goals is to show people or to show that person rather that you don't have to be someone that knows it all, that has it all figured out. You're going to go through tough times and, and you and I share a similar journey and that we had a, a previous marriage and we transitioned out of that marriage into uh, an independent life. And you and I spoke prior to this, and we had talked about how it was a, um, I describe it as a multifactorial journey, because it's not just uh, rediscovering who you are as a person, but also rediscovering what really matters to me in my life. And one of the things that we discussed before is that this time from going from the, the, the old self, if you will, into the new self. First of all, it's not straight. It's not a straight path. There's a lot of ups and downs. And the second thing is that it takes time. So for the person that's watching this, just to give some context to, from where you were before to where you are now, how much time passed and how many bumps in the road would you say that you encountered along the way? So much bumps. <laughs> Um, it's been 10 years since my divorce journey, but I would say it took me about five years to try and error everything before I even created my portfolio with money and then started to really understand who I am and going traveling and really understanding my deepest values. And so, like you said, it is definitely a journey and I've tried different investing strategies as well, like real estate, um, going through a financial advisor and then DIYing it and just losing some money along the way and then gaining some money along the way. And it's absolutely not a perfect path. And I think that's the fun of life as well, as we know that the life's ups and downs is where we gain the wisdom um, and the knowledge along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And so you described five years, that's half a decade of just the learning and getting to the point where you had the confidence to say, I'm going to try and, and try my hand at investing in certain places. And, and that's important, I think, for the person that's watching this, that is starting to see themselves in your journey, to understand that it takes time and to not get frustrated. There's going to be a lot of dark moments. Um, I had a conversation recently with someone about imposter syndrome, where they feel like people are going to figure them out. And I can definitely see how that can apply when transitioning from, from a couplehood where we identify as me and so-and-so, and then 
losing a lot of that stability and trying to figure out, hey, how am I going to do this on my own? I can imagine that there's definitely going to be a lot of uh, a sense of imposterism along that that journey. Oh, a hundred percent. And also regaining that sense of independence as well as a single person versus a unit, right? And yeah. that grief and loss takes time to process. And I think in society right now, I talk about a lot of emotions, no processing. I'm also a embodiment coach. Um, and I realized the more we suppress the emotions, the longer it will linger. And so if we allow ourselves to just really go through the emotions, the faster maybe perhaps the process is. But I also believe spiritually, um, we're all on our own journey and whatever lessons that we need to learn, they're there for a reason. Yeah. And you mentioned that you help your clients to find their North Star. And I'm curious, during your time of transition, what did you consider to be your North Star? Great question. Uh, my North Star, I realized that there is a theme in which everything um, that I do touches. And so that the top would be growth. So everything that I do in terms of traveling, learning, um, you know, building my business and coaching, it's all about how do I become uh, more of who I am, uh, more of my authentic self, but growing into that. It, I get like the acceleration from that journey. And then secondly, connections, being able to be on a podcast like this with you and just learning from each other. It's all my greatest joy working with my clients and really understanding who they are and how I can, you know, help them on their path. It just makes me so happy. And so even though traveling has been a big part in my life, it always has the element of growth and connections and even the way I do it. And so when I work with my clients, that's how I try to see the patterns within their life. It's like, what is something that you do so naturally that you don't even notice? Because your embodiment is your blind spot. Because it's so like already automatic, you don't even think it's a thing unless someone points it out. And so that's what my coaching offers is to be able to kind of reflect back to them um, what they've been doing all along. And once you get that clarity, it's so much easier to make decisions from there. It's interesting you say that because when you said, what's that one thing you do naturally that you don't even realize or that people praise you or, 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 or acknowledge within you? And that's what I talk about with my clients in the space of authenticity as their secret sauce. You know, what's that one thing that people come to you for that you do better than others? You know, and, and, and I, I, when I, I think I, I did a, a, a previous video on this, if I'm not mistaken, it might have been just a segment of a, of a longer video, but I did mention a few examples. You know, maybe you're that person that gives that advice to someone uh, around a certain topic and you're that go to person. Maybe you make the best cupcakes when there's some uh, space where you can utilize your love of baking and, and, and just bringing joy. Because I mean, if you're like me, food is love, you know, and, and it always puts a smile on my face when I have something good to eat. Um, so I, I find that really interesting, you know, because that's one of the parallels between the authentic and the abundance. So one of the things I'm curious about is that people oftentimes struggle with finding this balance between saving for the future and enjoying the present. And we kind of alluded that to that before, that it's not just about tightening the belt. So how do you guide your clients into finding that balance while staying true to themselves? Yeah. So in my first session of my coaching, I always start with what is your authentic values. And once we know that, uh, we put them in priority. I really love this quote from Oprah, where she says, you can have anything, but just not all at once. Mm -hmm. And so if you zoom out it throughout your life, uh, looking at it from a bigger point of view, you would have everything that you wanted. But I think we go through seasons in life. And so if we zoom back in to the present moment, what are the 
top one or two things that we can do to optimize and maximize those values right now so we can enjoy them as much as you can. But then there's other things in life that might be more suited for later, like retirement and such. Then we have to scurry away a little bit of money for that for the future. Because like you said, where there's old self, new self, but there's also present self and future self. So we want to make sure that we take care of you know the present and the future. And now, of course, everyone is different depending on the percentage of how much they can save for the future. Uh, mm -hmm. It depends on their age, their risk tolerance, how much money they make. And that personalized information is what I do for my clients. And once we figure that out, then it becomes a realistic plan that they feel good with so that they're enjoying enough of the present, but also feel safe enough that, you know, their future self is taken care of. Do you find that there are common struggles that most of your clients share, even though I would imagine they come from different backgrounds and different situations like you were mentioning, but do you find that there's are common struggles that kind of un unify most of them or, or that most of them have in common? Yeah, I think shame is a big one with money mm. because a lot of people don't talk about it because it's one of the most taboo topics of all time. Right. Um, it's very tied to self-worth. And so, in today's society, we also don't really process emotions well either. And so if we don't really talk about it, we don't process it, then it's lingering in our subconscious. And no matter what we do on the surface with strategy, there would be almost sabotaging behavior that would offset whatever positive actions we're trying to take if we don't address the root which is the limiting beliefs that comes with money, uh, the, the emotions of shame, guilt, and fear that comes with money. And so I think that's a very common narrative because almost all of us right now in Western society really tied our self-worth to, to money and how much money you make and how much net worth you have. And so uh, dissolving that I would be one of the first steps I take um, through my program with my clients. Is Do you find that the shame is something that's learned in adult life or this is something that they learn as, as children in the household? Um, it could be both because I think society in general already it's very strong in, um, in money shame. So it's almost hard to escape unless you have a family unit that is very clear on making boundaries with that, which is rare. And then um, with picking up any subconscious beliefs and such, um, it usually solidified at a very young age, however. Uh, so they're saying seven to 14, that's when you already have those beliefs uh, ingrained in you. And so, yes, most of the time they pick up it in childhood, but of course you can always pick it up later in life, um, especially if you have like some kind of trauma or a big events that happen around money. We know this this saying of the grass is green or on the other side and and some people talk about the 80/20 rule and the 80/20 rule can be applied in so many aspects of life. But I've heard the 80/20 rule also applied to this grass is green or on the other side where you know you may not realize that you possess 80% of what you really want but you're looking out at the 20% that you feel that would make your life happier. So you go for that and you wind up losing the 80%. So I'm curious, what do you think the role of social media and, and what we consume on there? Because everything is so filtered. I mean, quite literally in the photographs that we take, uh, that we see people take, you'll see them with filtered photos, but they also segment certain experiences in their life. And it gives this appearance that they have it all and they're very wealthy. So I'm curious, do you find that social media is a significant factor in the way that people are viewing their current financial goals and their frustrations around that? Oh, for sure. And just the other day, I was sucked into social media as well. <laughs> and, you know, the, the capsule wardrobe and the fashion and everything else. And so, I mean, even as a holistic money coach, I can get, you know, right. swept up in that as well. And so, I mean, 
that's just very common, especially the more you scroll on it, the more programming it gets like downloaded to, into our system, right? And so again, being mindful and conscious of what we're consuming is very important because it happens so subconsciously and so quickly that you don't even know what just happened. And as conscious of a person as I am, I can still get affected. And so by limiting the time on it will, first of all, help. Um, and always coming back to our values and our North Star, again, helps. It's like, wait, okay, I've seen all of these amazing things that people are doing, uh, buying, but wait, does that even uh, align with my authentic self? Hmm. If it does, great. Do I need a, a lot of it? Do I need 100% of it? Or do I need a 20% of it? Or do I already own 80% of it? Like you said earlier. And so really coming back to our compass uh, has always been so helpful. And that's why I create like that program um, that people can always refer back to every time they get lost and allowing yourself to get lost sometimes too, because the journey is never perfect. And it's just about remembering your anchor. Hmm. Yeah. Social media has certain uh, trending topics and themes, or maybe it's just what I, what I consume and the algorithm just feeds me more of that. You know, social media can be an echo chamber, but so a lot of the stuff that I've seen on social around creating a positive change in your life um, mentions not just manifestation, and that's a whole other topic, but gratitude. Gratitude mm -hmm. is, is, is shared as being one of the most powerful things that are out there. And it, it's, it's, it can be a vague term with respects to how it should be applied. But I'm curious if you find within your practice that gratitude plays a role in our uh, achieving financial uh, abundance that also aligns with our authenticity. Absolutely, because I think authenticity is all about remembering who you already are. You're not trying to become someone different. And that means we have to be grateful for what we already have. So gratitude actually puts you in a different energy state as well, um, which attracts in the manifestation point of view more of what you already have. It's more the attention that you put on something. You, it's like you see more of it, right? And so gratitude kind of does that. It's like, oh, wow, I realize that I'm abundant in relationships with people that I have so many amazing connections I get to have, it comes to you more. And that's the same thing when you're like the famous analogy of you see, you found out about this car that you love and now you see them everywhere on the street. Mm. And I guess in the scientific terms is where the um, uh, reticular activating system, you know, gets activated and you notice more of the same things. And that is the same thing with gratitude. The more, mm. you know, you notice that one thing, the more it comes to you. And with abundance, it's very related. Um, if you realize that, you know, you already possess all of these things, the abundance comes to you. And that helps actually with the scarcity mindset, because you're now focusing on something that is more fruitful instead of the lack. There's some people where writing comes naturally to them. That's something that I struggle with. I do a lot of mental notation, and mm -hmm. I know that there's power and benefit into writing things down. It's something that I have to consciously make an effort to do. So it doesn't come too naturally to me. Mm -hmm. But for those that writing and journaling comes a little bit more naturally to, do you find that they can use that approach towards helping them achieve uh and, and authentic abundance? Oh, absolutely. And that's very big part of my program. I uh, have a journaling exercise before every session. Uh, mm. So then they see, first of all, their patterns, because sometimes our brain is going 100 miles an hour with so many thoughts that are just floating around. And when you put them on paper, it actually clears it. It's, it's more obvious 
how those thoughts interact with each other. And sometimes like I find them laughable now because I, I can work myself up so hard in my head. And then once I put them on paper, it actually sounds ridiculous. <laughs> and then it, you almost remove your identity from those thoughts. Um, it's almost like a meditation practice to me. And once mm. you don't think it's so personal anymore, you can actually do something with it. And now uh, with gratitude, it's affirming. Once you write on pa the paper, you're like, wait, I'm acknowledging that I have all these things that or not, or where my thought patterns are. And that creates even more awareness and consciousness around what you're thinking or not thinking. And it, it, you're, you're kind of alluding to, to the next question I had a little more curiosity on, which is how do you help your clients or for the person who's watching or listening to this, how could you help them to distinguish between what they want and what they need? Mm, that's a really good one. It goes back to those values again. There is a difference between authentic wants and, uh, and needs and also ego wants and needs. Mm. So what does that even mean? Uh, so the ego, uh, what I mean by that, it's not so much the egotistic, like, ooh, um, you know, the, the bros on the street where, you know, I have to prove something, but in a way it is because the ego just want to prove something. And everyone has an ego, um, not in a bad sense, but in a protective sense. And so the ego just always want to feel safe and certainty. And so, and also want to fit in. And so this social media and everything that comes in really feeds into our ego. And those are things that we technically don't really feel fulfilled by. It might be a temporary pleasure that we receive, but not really a long lasting happiness that we get from it. So first of all, we want to discern usually by their spending habits uh, through my clients, like tracking sheet that we go through. What are the things that are maybe ego base and what are the things that are authentic base uh since we've kind of looked at our values and such um you know when we work together as uh, clients and so um that allows them to distinguish the difference but uh in terms of wants uh but in terms of needs um there's a part of the need that is coming from the authentic self that actually makes you fulfilled and happy you know, just as through the same process, we can, you know, discern from that. But there are survival needs as well, obviously. So you need to put food on a table. You need to have a roof over your head. And those are more basic things that, you know, we have to provide ourselves for. But then the new ones on that, it's like, okay, we do we need to own a home or can we rent? That's a really good debate to have mm. because societal narrative says you should own but then the thing is if you live a very high cost uh, society or world or city it might not actually financially make sense in terms of math wise to own a home with a very high interest rate it might actually be smarter to rent but is it the society society narrative forcing you to feel FOMO that you should own that you mm. should perhaps even um go into a lot of all the debt in order to make that happen just so that you can keep up with the Jonases or is it something that you can actually afford? And so that's another question to ask as well. We want to use an example to illustrate the difference. Yeah, that's, you mentioned the, the FOMO. And for those who don't know the acronym, it stands oh. for fear of missing out. And it's a very big thing. And it, it ties in so much that we were talking about already, the influence from social media, preconceived quote unquote truths that we've uh, convinced ourselves uh, of throughout the years, or we've been programmed to think throughout the years. And one of the things that I think we sometimes fail to consider is that we may not necessarily be trying to present an image for social media. It may be within even something more intimate. It could be with competing within the family. There's the successful sibling. There's the, the, the co-worker that has just bought a new house and you want to feel like uh, you're on par with them. Uh, and I'm curious, do you find with your clients that they sometimes struggle with keeping up with the Joneses, but more so within a, a closer, more intimate circle? 
Mm, that's a really good question. I don't think I've come across that yet. Um, but what I do is whenever uh, we try to make a purchase of any kind is to pause and think what is the core motivation behind that. Meaning, for example, I want to buy, say, this piece of clothing um, that it's like a brand name that is very expensive, for example. I'm going to pause and ask myself, why am I buying this? Is it because I have to prove it to somebody, maybe in the family, maybe it's a social media that I'm, you know, rich enough, that I'm good enough to fit in? Or is it because I genuinely like the material and the cost per wear is great and I just want to buy it? <laughs> or, you know, or is it some other reasons? And so understanding that is the consciousness, the awareness that comes with it. Then you can make an informed and intentional decision. So whatever really um, the outside influences are, it always comes back to the same thing. It's like, why are you doing what are you doing? Um, and a lot of times we just do it so automatically without thinking, uh, but it's like reminding ourselves to pause, to be, you know, it's almost like being meditative mm -hmm. before we do anything uh, with money specifically in my, in my coaching practice. And that reminds me of two things you had mentioned before about how we sometimes, the way I, the way I describe it, and you said it also, which is sometimes we confuse uh, pleasure with happiness. We choose something of pleasure, which is uh, a way of self self soothing, but those moments are short lived. They pass, and many times after we have these, when we confuse pleasure with happiness, um, people will experience feelings of of shame, which is what we talked about before, guilt, regret. And the other thing that came to mind when you were speaking is that in this last example you gave, it really sounds a lot like the way I define discipline to the people with whom I speak, which is discipline is sacrificing what you want now for what you want most. I love that. So you're starting to tiptoe into how do we get some techniques to, to get out of this. And so I, I want to, I want to delve into that a little more. So, for the listeners who are now starting to get all fired up and they feel like, you know what, I, 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 I'm going to start to reflect on my, my spending habits, where I've been allocating my energy, where I've been focusing my consciousness, my mindset. And I want to start to now take some steps to, to bring myself to a, a financial place, which not just provides me for the future, but also aligns with the things that matter to me most now. So what are some practical first steps that our listeners can take towards aligning their budgeting practices with their authentic selves? Yeah. So the first thing, um, like I said before, would be figure out your values, right? And through looking at your spending patterns, figure out the theme, the common theme of what you always spend money on. Now, it's a little deeper than a surface answer like um, beauty. Like, for example, if you see like that you spend a lot of money on makeup or skincare or whatever it is, it's like there's more an underlying value under that. So is it because of vanity, because you want to fit in, or is it that you truly appreciate aesthetics? Like, some, or you like, it's like a creativity thing for you. Like, what is the core value that actually lights you up? that you can actually do it creatively in other ways as well. Um, so for me, connection is a big thing. And so just being on a podcast fulfilled that need. But you can also go travel and connect with people, but it costs a lot of money, mm. right? And so there's the spectrum in which you can fulfill a need that is the same at its core. I'm curious, is there a, a success story that comes to mind, like a client that just kind of jumps out that really uh, uh, exemplifies this, this uh, transition into authentic mm. abundance? Yeah. Um, this client of mine, she uh, started off very frugal because she was in a lot of debt um, and her family member actually uh, had a lot of gambling addiction. And so she mm. was very scared and she turned completely in a scarcity mode because she was like, oh, you know what? I don't want to repeat the same mistakes as my family. You know, I, I was in debt, so let me get out of it. And she got out of it very quickly as well by being extremely like frugal with her habits, which is great. 
But the problem is then she start not really enjoying her life too much. And so when we work together, we realize that connections and frugality is kind of like the top two conflicting values. Hmm. And so we um, then that realization allowed her to actually um, spend more money on connections because we realize that she's already on track to save for her future. She already got out of debt. It, she is in a different phase in her financial health. And so we no longer have to stick to the old self, the old habits. And because of that, she's been having like her best life, living her best life, really um, just enjoying the money um, and also still safe for the future, but also to a point affecting her partner in a way that her partner is able to bring um, his own mom to Korea, which it haven't been in 10 years because that's where they're from. And so that experience in itself, it's magical because not only are you helping yourself to feel more abundant and authentic, uh, with your journey, but once you do that, it affects other people around you as well. And th this actually ripples out to three people because it's herself, uh, her partner, and her partner's mother. Hmm. And you mentioned this scarcity mindset, and sometimes people's financial situation just seems so dire. You know, they feel like there's going to be no way out of this hole that they're in. And and sometimes, like you just mentioned, it's not always your fault. Sometimes you were in a situation where you were pulled into a, a financially uh, negative situation. You were pulled into this financial hole. So for someone that feels overwhelmed by their financial situation, you know, what's a piece of advice you could give them to help them to start to look at their situation from a different perspective through a different lens? Yeah, um, I think, first of all, to acknowledge that, you know, it, you're in a hard place. Um, a lot of the times we beat ourselves up for being there and giving yourself compassion, I would say, mm. is the first step because the shame, again, like I mentioned before, keeps you stuck. And so once we allow that to dissolve, now we can look at the strategic uh, things with your money. We can be creative with, okay, what kind of uh, core values can we um, have been met creatively, you know, not using that much money so that you can still feel fulfilled. Um, and then you, magically so that sometimes changes your spending habits and then it might be able to create more savings or maybe you feel more motivated to work uh, more to get a higher income and now your financial situation can actually change and so it's pretty much a summary of everything that we've talked about in this podcast so far the different steps that we can take uh, but the first step Ironically, um, it's actually to acknowledge and give compassion to yourself first. That's really important. Yeah. You, you don't have to have it all figured out. Everybody is, in my coaching program, there are certain, I forget the term that they give it, but there, there are certain, we'll call them certain tenants that we reflect upon. And one of those is that everyone is doing the very best they can at any given moment, you know, and it's not your fault all the time. Yet even if you made some crummy decisions, it's not your fault. I'm sure you were trying your best. Maybe the best was, I just really want to enjoy this moment. I want to have a YOLO moment, you know, or I, I, I just wanted to do something nice for someone. And you made a financial investment, which one that becoming unwise in the long term or that hurt you, putting you in some form of debt. So compassion is, is the first step, as you mentioned. The other thing is what happened in the past happened in the past. Let's look at what you want to do for the future. As we look to the future, let's remember that, hey, you don't have to jump from the floor to the top of the mountain. You're going to take one step at a time. And if you're faced with a moment where you're thinking, maybe I should go down a certain road, pause. Pause and reflect. Why do I want to go and make this decision? Is this going to serve me? And then when we take our time for ourselves within those pauses, sometimes they could be long pauses. We could use things, as you mentioned, like mindfulness, like journaling. And then using resources that are online for us, just like this podcast. So eventually we'll get there. And this is this is a marathon from what you're saying. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. This is a, 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 a game of endurance, if you will. You get to enjoy that marathon along the way. Yeah, it'll pay off eventually. Doesn't mean you're not going to be hurting <laughs> at certain points. It's 
at some points, but I think it's relishing in the ups and downs of life and that's being a part of it um, and accepting that not everything's going to go our way all the time. And I think yeah. just really understanding that uh, really helps me to find more peace um, because we can constantly worry about the future, what can go wrong and things like that. And that's where the overwhelm comes in. Um, but if, like you said, if we can just take a step back and really be in the present moment, hey, what kind of things do I already have? The gratitude, but also what little step can I take going forward? It just makes life so much more enjoyable. And to kind of like tie it all together, I'm curious, what are some common misconceptions that people have about budgeting and wealth creation that you'd like to debunk? Yeah, um, I don't even like the word budgeting because it feels very restrictive. And hmm. so I like to reframe that to the word spending plan because it feels like, ooh, I get to spend money. So even the mindset shift already happens right there. Instead of like, oh, you know what? I'm going to have to constrain myself. I can only spend that amount of money within my budget. Spending plan feels a lot more uh, fun. And the thing is, I think most of us like to have fun. And so mm -hmm. really inject that in, uh, in the way we look at money, because money is really just a tool for us mm -hmm. to use to enjoy our life. And that's the, the whole purpose of it. And we sometimes take it so seriously that we're like, oh, we're going to do this and bootstrap and all of that. And that's where we can be sustainable with the plan. And it's all about that marathon. And so that's the first thing. Uh, and then also a lot of people think investing is very risky um, because I think um, without the proper education, you would think that uh, you know, we're gambling our money away when we, you know, put money in stocks. And so it just really understanding that most investing strategies that are um, safe is actually a long term game is, in fact, very boring. <laughs> mm -hmm. You just put, you know, a certain savings amount every single month and put it in the same type of investing strategy and let it ride for the next 20, 30 years. Mm. That's it. It's not that sexy, actually. <laughs> and so um, the things that we hear, you know, on the news is like, oh, we're going to, you know, put money in this stock and this stock. And that's a different strategy that is meant for very um, people who can take higher risk, but who also have a lot more knowledge with it. But it doesn't mean that at the average person can invest. And so I think I just want to uh, reassure people that, you know, with the proper education, you everyone can, even though what, if you just need to put $50 away every single month, you can start somewhere. Hmm. So I like to pose this question. Imagine that today is the last day of your life. And tomorrow morning, all of your work is completely gone. There's no footprint of you. But you can leave the world with one message that will last forever. What is that one message you'd like to leave with people? Mm, that's a really, really good one. I think the strongest message that I have is that no matter what happens to you, the life's up and downs. As long as that you learn something from it, then you've lived the best life you can. So what I mean by that, because I have been through a lot in life and they could be pretty hard lessons, uh, pretty hard things. And we can feel really down um, by the things that you have no control over. But every time I, I go through those experiences, I see them as lessons for my soul. It's like, ooh, you know what? I get to learn this. You know, I'm leveling up every time. Um, I'm being, becoming more mature and more conscious and more self-actualized every time I go through them. And then what, no matter gets, what gets thrown at you, it, it cannot really get you down because there's always a positive outcome that comes from, from it. It's a lesson. <laughs> and so that's kind of the major takeaway that I have so far in my life. Um, because that way it builds your resilience and literally everything. It's, it's just, you know, a lesson. <laughs> what does authenticity mean to you? Authenticity is about returning back to who you are already. That means that I think we're already born a certain way, but along the way, when we uh, live through this life, we get 
um, programmed by other people, by uh, society, by all those things, and we forget who we are. And so authenticity is just about unlearning and mm. going back to that natural state that is already gifted within us. For people that were inspired by what you had to say, people that want support in going through this financial, uh, through this journey to authentic abundance, how can people follow you, find you, work with you? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my website is called authentic-abundance.com. And I'm also on Instagram and TikTok by the name at authentic.abundance. Awesome. And I also started a newsletter as well. And so if you go on my website, you can join a newsletter and then I give you uh, frequent inspirations of things that I, you know, get downloaded. Um, and then that way you can learn tips and tricks and, and different musings from me. Um, and I have a membership right now um, in the Facebook group that is free. And then you get one workshop a month uh, to learn about a specific topic about money. Beautiful. And I'm going to leave links to everything you mentioned in the description. And I want to thank you, Clover, for joining me today and having this conversation. It was amazing speaking with you. And I learned so much. And I'm sure that my, my listeners, our listeners and viewers did as well. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so fun. And I hope that, you know, um, people can learn about more authentic, um, how to tap into their authenticity and abundance from this conversation. Definitely. And for those that are watching, I'm curious, what is your experience with creating an abundant life, a financially free life that's also authentic to yourself? Tell me in the comments. And remember that you can fail at what you don't want. So you might as well take a chance at doing what you love. And I'll see you in the next episode. But until then, don't forget to mind your business, the business of being you.